security? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, what's up, everybody? Good morning. Welcome to the party. Today is Friday or fry yay, depending on who you are and what you're doing, March 29th, 2024. This is episode 589 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Lozier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Kimberly Can Fix It, DJ BSEC, SSD, Micah Romine, Carrie, Dante Jennings, broke hacker in real life, folks over on LinkedIn like Logan Fuller and Raymond Cruz. Although Raymond Cruz has been sliding over to the YouTube channel, so welcome to the party, pal, Raymond Cruz. We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. Jeremy Williams in the house. Good to see you, Jeremy. Hope the boo-boo bus is good. Over the next 45 minutes, me, you, and all of you are going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can we use this information to drive cyber risk reduction down for our business stakeholders. Occasionally, I sprinkle in a hot take. And if you're looking to break into the industry, you're going to get value here because you will be asked at any single job interview, how do you stay current on the industry? Guess what, y'all? The Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief podcast is a phenomenal answer. And I'm not just saying that because it's my podcast. Literally, we're doing the work day in and day out, consistency, vigilance, they, you got to do it. it. That's that's part of the game here in cybersecurity, lifelong learning. So settle in. We've got a great show for you. Of course, it's Friday, which means it's Grayson's Joke of the Week presented by James McQuiggan at 35,000 feet. We've got Easter themed jokes. So you'll look forward to that at the mid roll. And then as always, we'll conclude the show with a 30 minute jaw jack. And I saw Jerry guy running around here with his glasses. So somewhere he'll come by and um, we'll have a great show. But before we get into it, I want you all to know, including Jenny Housley. Hey, Jenny, good to see you in chat. I want Jenny and all of you to know that I do not prepare or research for any of these stories I'm about to go through. So you're going to be getting my honest reaction and thoughts on all of these. Most of the time, they're right on. But sometimes, you know, uh, mod chat and regular chat, you guys come swooping in with your perspective. Perfect example, Ghana yesterday. I kind of made a sweeping statement. Uh, but it was based on one instance of an ABC news story I saw. And we got that sorted out right away. So it's all about good times. It's all about community. It's all about support. Let's get into it. But before we get into the stories, let's get into shouting out the stream sponsors. Those wonderful uh, businesses that I partnered with. And I am so happy to be able to come out here every single morning and shout into this microphone and let uh, you know, the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Free podcast happened. I want to start with Barricade Cyber Solutions, y'all. If you got a threat actor in your environment, that's not good. You got to get them out there. So Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and helping recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions, you know what they know how to do? Yeet threat actors out of the environment and mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. So believe that. Check them out at BarricadeCyber.com. Links in the description below. Also want to say shout out and love to my good friend Brandon Poole and the team at Panopsi Security. Panopsi Security, if you didn't know, Panopsi is a partner that can understand your cyber program and your business. What does that mean? It means, guys, literally, you can't secure all the things. You can't educate all the people. How do you do it? How do you spend your resources? How do you like? How do you execute on strategic planning, on tactical exercises? Panopsi Security has the knowledge and brain trust and the ability to do that for you. Call Brandon Poole over at Panopsi.com. 
Ask him about threat hunting. Ask him about tabletops. I'll give you a perfect example. This happens all the time. You're looking to uh, purchase MDR services, manage detection response services, bunch of vendors out there. Which one's right for your business? You do not want to make a $300,000 oopsie, right? Well, Panopsi.com can help you with that. So go check them out. Love Brandon Poole and his team. And obviously anti-siphon training, but more about them at the mid-roll. Each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Brief is worth half a CPE. So take a screenshot of you saying what's up in chat. That's why it's on stream there. And get those CPEs. File them away. It's half a day, two and a half a week, 10 a month. You get the idea. You only need uh, like 40 a month, uh, excuse me, 40 a year on average. And you can get 120 if you're hanging with the crew here. Everyone with a blue badge right now right now knows you can get 120 credits. Carrie, Kimberly, et cetera. All the great folks in here. I love it. If you don't know what to type or you're just wanting to like shout out from the rooftops that you're part of the Simply Cyber community, hashtag Team SC in chat. I certainly am a member of the Simply Cyber community and very, very proud of it. Hashtag Team SC. And finally, I've been talking to a lot of people. I sent out um, my cheat sheet out uh, wide and far to, you know, to the Ethernet, uh, the Ethernet, into the Ether on the Internet. And uh, so there might be some newcomers here. So if today is your first episode of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief, if you're like, what the heck is this guy? But I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to see it through and see what happens. Drop a hashtag first timer in chat. Hashtag first timer. Hashtag first timer in chat. We've got a great show for you. Do me a favor. Sit back. Relax. And let's let the cool sounds of the hot news Fancy. wash over us all in an awesome way. I, I literally I had to reboot and I was talking to BSEC in the green room. So I literally have no idea what the stories are. Like I didn't even see the titles today. So well, let's see what happens. Somebody get a 20-sided die and roll it. We'll see what happens here. Let's go. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Friday, March 29th, 2024. I'm Steve Prentice. 17 billion personal records exposed in data breaches in 2023. Okay. This number comes from Flashpoint's 2024 Global Threat Intelligence Report, which states that reported data breach incidents rose by 34.5% in 2023 to 6,077. Much of these included sensitive information such as names, social security numbers, and financial data. The report adds that over 70% of these incidents resulted from, quote, unauthorized access that stemmed from outside the affected organization, end quote. A major reason for this surge in data breaches, the report says, is ransomware attacks, with Flashpoint highlighting an 84% increase in documented ransomware incidents in 2023. All right, before we get into this story, Joe Mitchell, welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. And, uh, and uh, community, if you can, drop some uh, Bruce Willis, welcome to the party, pal, action on Joe Mitchell. Welcome to the party. Great to have a first timer in chat. Hope you enjoy the show. All right, guys, first story out the shoot 17 billion with a B personal records exposed. That's pretty gross. Uh, you can see that there was an increase in 34% of. Uh, reported data breaches in 2023, which is obviously going to uh, influence more records being exposed. I do want to point out really quickly that they're talking about reported data breaches. So as disgusting as it is, 17 billion personal records is the floor. It's probably more. Um, I mean, like it would have to be more, right? They're, not every single data breach is made public, right? And I want to point out a lot of these publicly reported ones Businesses are reporting them because they have to. No business gets breached and is like, oh my God, like wiping the brow. They're like, we finally recovered from that. And they're like, hey, we should voluntarily notify everybody about this data breach. Since we have no obligation to do it, we should do it out of good faith. No, 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 no. No one's doing that. Okay. So states like California, states like Maine, uh, you know, HIPAA as a, as a federal regulation, these are the reasons that things get public, uh, public, dude, I am like making up words today. 
between ether. I mean, ethernet's a really word, but or whatever. Anyways, um, so anyways, uh, this is part of the reason I love breach notification laws. We should know we're the victims. I get that your crappy information security led to a data breach, but we are the victims. I also want to point out that they said there's 6,000 um, data breaches in 2023. Check this out. Lockbit is responsible for, where did I see it? Lockbit, 1,049 victims last year. So like, if, if you do kind of the back of the napkin math, one out of every six data breaches was Lockbit, which is gross. And by the way, which is why I say um, Lockbit is a tier one threat actor, right? When I say tier one threat actor, I mean the creme de la creme, like borderline nation state threat level threat actor. Uh, again, Lockbit um, has been tampered down by law enforcement and Lockbit sup the guy behind Lockbit is kind of like cropped back up. I think they claimed a new uh, a new victim yesterday too. TLDR guys, we live in data breach land. Like we live in ransomware land and we live in data breach land. You, you should all of your planning and response efforts should assume breach should assume that you're going to be publicly reporting uh, data breaches. So when you're doing tabletop exercises or when you're doing anything, you should include things like, how do we notify people? How much is identity theft? Like how much is identity theft going to it cost for 2 million people? Right. And I know it's like a joke uh, that each of us have like six different um, identity theft protections running concurrently, like a tire fire, but, but even though it's a joke, somebody's paying for it, right? So your business, if you have to pay for 2 million identity theft protections, like that's not free, right? Oh my God. Butler NA. Oof. Oh, sorry, bro. Um, okay. Um, yikes. Um, re uh, okay. So anyways, this is a great report. It's an annual uh, report. Uh, there's a couple annual reports that come out during the year that are definitely, um, I would, yeah, uh, are definitely worth reading. This one, I, I, this one, I don't know. Okay. So flashpoint 2024 global threat and tell report. You let me know the two reports that are annuals that I would absolutely strongly recommend. Uh, number one is the Verizon data breach incident report. Whoops. Data breach incident report. This might be my favorite annual, um, report. This is the 2023 one. Such good data points. Uh, such like such solid, solid information uh, in here. And then the other one, I think it's the FBI annual report, annual crime report. Little, little less. The FBI annual crime report's a little less sexy and a little less, uh, you know, polished and stuff, but you know, it's, it's, it's real data. It's not influenced by, um, by any type of um, marketing or anything like that. Let's keep going. U.S. Treasury warns financial sector about AI cybersecurity threats. This report points out some usual suspects, such as sophisticated malware and social engineering attacks, and highlights how AI can reduce barriers to entry for less skilled attackers. It also mentions vulnerability discovery and disinformation, such as using deep fakes to impersonate high-ranking corporate officers in order to defraud companies. Interviewees for this report said they are, quote, paying attention to unique cyber threats to AI systems used in financial organizations, which could be a particular target for insider threat actors. These include data poisoning attacks, which aim to corrupt the training data of the AI model, end quote. Also noted in this report with the resource requirements of AI systems, which it suggests will increase institutions' direct and indirect reliance on third-party IT infrastructure and data. All right. So, uh, you know, here we go. Shall we play a game? AI's in the house. U.S. Treasury urging financial sector to address AI cybersecurity. Hey, here's, here's a new headline. U.S. insert agency name urges insert industry name to address AI cybersecurity threats. Guys, like, I get it. I get it. I get it. Like, go where the money is. So financial sector is obviously going to be targeted first. But that South Korean 
uh, $25 million business email compromise attack. I'm pretty sure that wasn't a financial services company. They were using AI to commit crime and they got paid, man. Great cash, homie. But my, my point is, yeah, my point is, uh, and B-Sex echoing this, like AI is here. We should be using it, but you should educate your end users on the weaponization of AI. And guys, by the way, like I always talk about information security awareness and making it effective and behavior modifying and stuff. One of the techniques you have to do is you have to resonate with your end users, right? Like if I tell Carl in accounting, Carl, oh. if I tell Carl in accounting, like, oh, you'll never believe the, you know, the petaflops of chat GPT and how you can, you know, get, get it to break out of its guardrails. Like Carl doesn't give a sh about that. Carl's looking at his bracket, getting busted, talking about Clemson and, you know, Alabama and stuff like that. So what you need to do is say, Hey, listen, AI, AI is being used to make someone in a zoom call look like Tom Cruise. And what? Like, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, and then you're like, imagine they made it not just look like Tom Cruise. They made it look like the boss. And then the boss told the guy he was fired or the boss, you know, like whatever. Like, like use real examples that impact in an effective way and resonate with your end users to get that. Now, uh, one thing specific to addressing this risk, if you do work in financial sector, if you do work in um, any particular um, space that, you know, I guess has money, right? Like everybody has, every space has money. What I would say is as you're looking at the threats of business email compromise, specifically uh, side note, business email compromise is like literally the second biggest cyber threat that you should be mindful of. Number one's ransomware, but business email compromise is like a sleepy giant. Number two, um, I, I think, you know, having out of band um, verification methods, even biometric verification methods, excuse me, methods like think of how can you circumvent, not circumvent, but how can you undermine AI, right? AI can make, make this, you know, make someone look like the CFO, but they can't replicate the CFO's thumbprint or facial recognition or iris, right? Like, and I know this sounds a little mission impossible ish, but my, my point is like it, it you should look at your controls that you have in place to verify the release of, you know, money at whatever threshold, right? So, you know, over $500,000, over $1 million, right? Maybe you have two people have to agree to it in person. Maybe you have some type of code word, right? I know this sounds silly, but maybe you have a code word like, you know, banana pancakes, right? Something stupid, but like a threat actor and AI are not going to be able to know what that keyword is in any capacity. Um, so, you know, unless you're, unless you documented an email, they break in your email, they get that. But now we're talking about, you know, multiple layers of attack. They'd have to know you have a keyword and all that other stuff. So my, my point is as a practitioner, you may want to use that $25 million business email compromise story as impetus to discuss with your executive team, hey guys, like AI is freaking crushing right now. We should probably think of some way to mitigate the risk of getting on a Zoom call with five fake people and telling Carl and finance to release all of our money, right? Mergers and acquisitions happen all the time. Ask BSEC. He knows what's up. Priceless pancake in this house in this house guys i must like i do i did i fall down and hit my head today i'm speaking like adult uh priceless pancake with the super chat thanks priceless we just become best friends yep. use the pod to convince management to use a verbal c-suite authorization password because of the 25 million dollar story exactly priceless pancake you nailed it exactly thank you retail chain hot topic hit by new credential stuffing attacks the so, chain has itself become a hot topic that upon disclosing so that two right waves of credential stuffing attacks in November exposed customers' PII and partial payment data. The chain has over 630 store locations across the U.S. and Canada. The attacks occurred, quote, through its website and mobile application on November 18th and 19th and November 25th, 2023, using valid account credentials such as email addresses and passwords obtained from an unknown third-party source, end quote. 
Their announcement comes after five other waves of credential attacks targeting Hot Topic customers that happened last year in February, March, twice in May, and again in June. <laughs> Oh, okay, hold on. Ooh, a Zen Hammer attack bypasses right. Row Hammer defenses on AMD Oh my AMD god, CPU. stop. Okay, so Hot Topic. That Hansel's so hot right now. Oh, Hot Topic, you're so hot right now. Um, never shopped at Hot Topic personally, but, you know, it's been around since like the 90s. Um, and uh, credential stuffing attack. So really quickly, credential stuffing, if you don't know, <clears throat> it's basically where you get a data dump of username and passwords and you would try to log into other sites with that same username and password. The reason it works is because people, I'll give a hint, people reuse passwords. That's that's it. It's, it, it's actually, it's kind of a perfect storm. People reuse passwords and businesses don't require multi-factor authentication. And when you get that beautiful synergy going on, oh, stand back because Threat Actor Academy 101, like your first class at Threat Actor Academy, it's credential stuffing. It's not super complicated, really. I mean, you, you basically just grab from here and throw it over there. Um, I don't know why they're hitting hot topic. Honestly, I don't, I don't know what you're getting. Maybe stored credit cards, maybe some information on purchasing, but like, you know, I, I don't know. I Again, I don't read the story in advance. So if they're getting into, um, if they're getting into like employees, <clears throat> employees um, files, then that's different. But this is target impacting customers. So I think, you know, whatever, they're getting freaking like maybe addresses, like low level stuff, honestly that maybe they'll bundle and sell on the dark web. Like to me, this is one of those ones, like it's pretty lightweight to do because it's all automated insert list and then fire it off. Like it's pretty low impact, but at the same time, what's the real return on investment for the threat actor? You know what I mean? Uh, Rex with the super chat, Rex. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you, Rex. I think that hot topic pun qualifies as the bad pun for today. <laughs> hot topic. Hot pocket. Okay. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, you know, we'll see. this was from mid journey. Oh, oh uh, yeah. Hey, way to go. Mid journey getting words right now. Um, yeah. So there's nothing here. I mean, this sucks for any company. Here's my thing. If you have an internet facing business, like I know it's going to be painful, but require multi-factor authentication or accept credential stuffing attacks. Your choice. This is not the first time Hot Topic's been hit in the last year. I, I remember a story with them getting hit. So like, I don't know what you're about, Hot Topic, but I just hope that they don't pull the same PR snafu as um, 23andMe where they come out and blame their users for having crappy passwords. Who's Researchers from ETH Zurich have developed a new variant of the Rowhammer Dynamic Random Access Memory Attack that now works against AMD Zen 2 and Zen 3 systems. They state that this proves, quote, that AMD systems are equally vulnerable to Rowhammer as Intel systems, which greatly increases the attack surface, end quote. Rowhammer was first disclosed in 2014 as an attack that exploits DRAM's memory cell architecture to alter data by repeatedly accessing a specific row, that's the hammering part, to cause the electrical charge of a cell to leak to adjacent cells. Yeah, okay. The, okay, so Rowhammer... Okay, hold on one second. Let me get out of this thing. Zenhammer attack bypasses Rowhammer defenses. I didn't even know they had Rowhammer defenses. Um, this is that I almost feel like this attack. And again, maybe somebody who's way more sophisticated, maybe NSA operators are in chat, just like rolling their eyes at me for being so, so like, um, obtuse, but dude, the row hammer attack is like a side channel, super specific attack on the hardware architecture. It's like, Literally, the way that modern compute architecture works is sending electrical signals, which cause, you know, if there's a signal on the line, it's a one. And if there's no signal, it's a zero. 
right? Zeros and ones, binary. We combine that to make hexadecimal. And this is how computers talk and store memory and all that other stuff. This attack is literally hammering one row on a computer architecture in order to leak data, like what's the bit, what's the byte, from that row into another row that can be accessed by a threat actor. This is like such a, like this Mission Impossible wouldn't even do this. This is like, I always thought the row hammer attack was like novel. I don't know. I've never heard of an example of it actually being um, done in the wild. The machine would have to be on and running with secrets in that particular memory space to be leaked. Like, like, so many things have to line up on this one that I just, I always thought of it as, was Rohammer an academic paper? I, I, I almost feel like Rohammer had to have been an academic paper because this is one of those things that's like super cool, but like in practice, it like, hold on, I just, I want to see if it was an academic paper. Let me see if I can find the word academic. Uh, as of 2018, most patch proposals made by academia were either impractical to deploy. Uh, let me see. I just want to, uh, uh, yeah. So it was like, it was like research papers and stuff like that. Okay. So as far as I know, it, like it could be, it could be, um, exploited. There's demonstrations, but like, I don't know. I don't know how much, how practical it is guys. Um, like just to use China as an example, all right? Like espionage all over the place. You do not need to like, you do not need to like get in and do row hammer attack. I'll just ask somebody. I'll Like, I'll just ask somebody to install malware. <laughs> like, or I'll just pay someone to give me the secrets. Like I, I, this happens, but I don't like, it, like, I guess what I'm saying here is not to be a complete, jack wagon but like if you're doing threat modeling if you're looking at how to spend your budget to defend from threat actors like row hammer is never coming up in your threat model because a million other attacks are way more likely to come on now uh amd chips i guess there was row hammer defenses put in place and now there's a circumvent to that this just also echoes the um perennial cat and mouse game between um threat actors and good guys, right? Row hammer comes out. It's a potential attack. Some defense comes into place to prevent that attack. New attack comes out, Zen hammer to bypass that. It's the same thing with, uh, just to take you down a, a little bit of a yesteryear road. Um, you know, like there was like a uh, buffer overflow attacks. So then Microsoft windows architecture came out with ASLR and DEP, right? Uh, which basically would in put, put um, functions in random places in memory so you couldn't just reach out and grab them. You'd have to find them. And DEP prevents you from executing code within certain spaces. So you'd have to turn that flag off. Threat actors figured that out, how to turn the flag off and how to find that memory. So then we came out with some other techniques. And then um, we, we blocked all the abilities to do that. Then they came out, uh, they discovered uh, return-oriented programming, ROP. And now there's ROP gadgets. So then they came out with some techniques around that. Then they came out with JOP, jump-oriented programming, right? Like it's this, it's this epic battle between good and bad. And you got to remember, guys, like every time a defender, every time one of us come out with some way to prevent an attack from working, there's a threat actor somewhere looking at their kids going, I got to figure out how to feed you. I got to come up with a new technique, right? Or, and I say that almost playfully humorous, but you've got to remember the attacker is motivated because they're doing it either because they're in the military of a com of a country that that's their orders and they want to succeed on that, or they're trying to get paid. And why do they want to get paid? So they can fund their lifestyle, whether it's feeding their kids, putting a house over them or buying a second yacht, whatever it is, that's what's up. So if they don't, pivot their attacks they're just done dead in the water and nobody nobody's got time for that and now a word from our sponsor veronis ready to reduce your risk without taking any well try veronis's free data risk assessment it takes minutes to set up and in 24 hours you will have a clear risk-based <sighs> view of the data that matters most and a clear path to automated remediation 
Get started for free today at veronis.com slash CISO series. That's V-A-R-O-N-I-S dot com slash CISO series. All right. Joe Mitchell, we do this every day. Hi, All right, guys, I hope you're getting value from the stream. I hope you're getting value, whether it's educational value, entertainment value. Heck, it's just a Friday and you're straight kicking it. Hit that like button. It goes a long way. Joe Mitchell, first timer in chat. He may have found the show because everybody hit that like button yesterday. So pay it forward. Hit the like button on YouTube. I don't care about the vanity metrics. I don't care about how many likes we get. I just care that if we get enough it will trigger the YouTube algorithm. So I'm asking, um, let me get a Bernie Sanders meme. I'm asking you <laughs> to hit the like button. Uh, or once again, I'm asking you, whatever that meme was. All right, guys, shout out to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Panopsi, and Anti-Siphon Training. Anti-Siphon Training is disrupting the traditional training industry by providing high quality, cutting edge education to everyone, regardless of financial position. They offer their students the opportunity to learn skills, actual practice, practical skills that are in demand, practice what is taught, and really engage with the community in a fun and inclusive way. Anti-Siphon training, links in the description below. Go giddy up on them, you'll love it. Trust me, I love their training. Lots of people in chat love their training. So you won't be disappointed, I promise you. We got the Simply Cyber Community Challenge every single day. One new person takes the baton and shares their story. If you wanna blow up your professional network on LinkedIn and make the LinkedIn algorithm, the feed that you read every day in your home feed, all cybersecurity content, there's an easy way to do it. Go on LinkedIn and search for the hashtag you see at the bottom of the screen right now, hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Connect to the people in the posts and comment on their posts. It's as easy as that. You will in two weeks, I guarantee you in two weeks time, your LinkedIn feed will be significantly improved if you want to work in cyber or you work in cyber and you want your LinkedIn feed to be like that. Now, every single day we have one person with the baton. Zishan Ali has the baton right now. Zishan Ali does not appear to be in chat. Is Sunny in chat? No, I don't see Sunny. We need one person to take the baton. Don't be shy. It's not intimidating. And if you are intimidated by it, all the more reason for you to be the one to raise your hand and step into the light and give it a shot. Let us introduce. I, and if you have taken, um, if you have taken the baton challenge, share in chat what your experience was like. I guarantee you, there isn't a single person that had a bad experience from it, at least that I know of. All right, every single day of the week has a different segment. Today is Friday, which means it's Grayson's joke of the week. Grayson is my son. He used to own this segment till he flaked off. But James McQuiggan at 35,000 feet has taken the mantle. Let's go. So uh, James wants to know, hey, chat. Hey, Claudia Manta. Claudia Manta, did you hear about the most beautifully decorated eggs? I don't, Claudia, I don't know if you heard about the most beautifully decorated eggs, but they are absolutely to die for. Oh, they're to die for. Now, uh, what's a buddy's favorite genre of music? BSEC, our, our local DJ. Do you know a uh, bunny's favorite genre of music? I'll give you a hint. It's hip hop. <laughs> All right. Hey, ZMF and Ann coming here. What doesn't, why don't Easter eggs make good hackers? ZMF and Ann, why don't Easter eggs make good hackers? Obviously, you know that they crack under pressure. They're notorious for it. And finally, divine dream divine, Wilbert Phillip. Why don't you see dinosaurs at Easter? Jonathan, Anna Lynn, why don't we see dinosaurs at Easter? Oh my God, they're egg stinked. They are egg stinked. Thank you, James McQuiggan at 35,000 feet. Appreciate it. Let's get back into the news and finish strong. I said, let's get back into the music and finish strong. Wi-Fi <laughs> site blocks functions due to malware campaign. Administrators of PyPy, a vital Python code repository, halted certain functions due to a malware upload campaign, restoring them after a 10-hour suspension. 
Researchers at Checkmarks and Phylum are investigating the attack, suspecting a multi-stage assault targeting crypto wallets and sensitive browser data. The attackers employed typo squatting, disguising malicious code packages as legitimate ones. Users now are cautioned against downloading seemingly authentic packages that could compromise their systems with just one typo. PyPy's temporary halt reflects the ongoing battle against malware infiltration in software repositories, underscoring the need for heightened vigilance amongst developers and users alike. All Pyf right, all right. All it takes is a single misplaced mi finger on the keyboard. All right. So here's the deal. I I'll go pretty quick on this one because uh, we've covered this a little bit, uh, well, quite a bit lately. PyPy is a... Um, it's like think of it as like GitHub, but for like Python um, library or uh, library Python scripts, basically. Uh, very popular. People use it all the time. You import from it. Like I've said on the channel before. Um, like I said in the channel before, and maybe I'm maybe I'm um, an uh, an outlier. But like when I import when I import Python packages into my Python code. Uh, I'm not reading the package, right? I Google like, I need a web scraper Python. Beautiful soup comes up. I say, excellent, import into, import beautiful soup into my code. And then I write my code, right? I'm not, I'm not doing that level of due diligence. And because of that, I'm exposing myself to risk because threat actors have figured out that they can use typo squatting or like, you know, basically um, creating a, malicious uh python file called beautiful soup except the e and the a are in beautiful or swapped and now it's looks like beautiful soup but it's actually probably a web scraper but also has like information stealing stuff or it reaches out to a c2 domain to pull down a second stage payload whatever it is this is what they're doing so shout out to the PyPy administrators because essentially they kind of locked the site up um, didn't allow new users to create, be created. They didn't allow new code to be uploaded until they got their arms around it. <clears throat> All I can say is I would educate your end users on this particular attack. Now, it gets tricky here because if you educate Carl in finance, he doesn't even know, like with all due respect, an end user isn't going to know what Python is, right? They're not going to know what programming languages are. They're not going to know what code is. But you can't just focus exclusively on IT uh, because people in like research and development, sometimes you'll, you will have someone who's like an accountant, but they like, you know, they dabble with code. So they may have some Python scripts to help clean up data and stuff like that. So um, unfortunately, you, you do have to kind of cast a wide net to educate your end users. Um, one trick, if you really want to get like, I guess not fancy, but if you really wanted to like dial in and target your end users, you could look in your SIM for endpoints that are going to, you know, PyPy repos for data and then map that the IP of the endpoint to an end user. Again, I know this is a little bit, um, you know, specific, but... I would send this to your IT team and maybe your engineering team. Those are kind of the you know likely candidates. And then maybe just do a quick sniff um, to see if anyone else is going to PyPy. Again, you're not trying to comprehensively stop all of this from happening. You're just trying to reduce the risk of a developer or a, a, a moonlighting developer pulling down a malicious uh, repo. As always, you know these malicious sites, when they do compromise the endpoint it's still got to reach out for second stage payloads and crap like that so hopefully you have a decent firewall perhaps next gen firewall which i know is a punchline but like if it's getting updated real time with threat feeds and blocking dynamic uh known compromised ip addresses or known compromised uh malicious domains you can get a little bit of additional security essentially um from you know so like Kevin actually does download a malicious function or a malicious Python and and then executes it, you could still prevent the 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 second stage payload from coming down onto Kevin's machine and your environment uh, with those additional network layer controls. Pilgrim Health Network updates data breach <laughs> total. I guess actually I say this only because um, ZMF is in chat, and if you know, you know Python is a snake, so. 
And Snake is a Metal Gear Solid thing, so shout out to that. This follows a ransomware attack that happened in April of last year <laughs> by attackers that still have not been identified. Harvard Pilgrim said, quote, the files involved may contain personal data and protected health information on current and former subscribers and dependents, as well as current contracted providers, end quote. The nonprofit serves more than 1.1 million members who primarily reside in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, and Connecticut. Cisco patches. I yeah, way to go, New England. What's up? Shout out to all my New England people. Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare in the house. Okay, so it's just to put it in perspective, 2.9 million people had their health uh, or had a data breach. I don't know if it was health data or not. You got to remember in health networks, there's tons of financial data too. Also TLDR, just to revisit this first story, 17 billion records, billion records. So like Harvard Pilgrim Health, like the 2.9 million, that's cute. Go sit at the kids table. Okay, uh, ransomware attack. Data exfil is like the standard operating procedure for these ransomware threat actors now. I'm actually kind of curious what kind of data was actually involved in this attack. That's really what how you'll um, want to respond in kind. Uh, it doesn't really say actually what kind of data was in here. Um, It's, it's, you know, it sucks. I mean, it doesn't suck, but it's like, whatever. Like I, I do like the record, uh, recorded future news. I do like it, but like, this is the story. The first two paragraphs are actually about the actual story. And then it's like, here's context. Like there was an attack on T-Mobile in 2021, a similar incident incurred against a government. Right. And then like, then it kind of goes back into some story. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being picky. I wish it actually told us what kind of data was in there. Oh, here it is. Personal data, protected health information on current and former subscribers and dependents, which is basically um, patients, right? So that sucks. If you have a medical condition that's like social stigma, um, that's been compromised. If you have a terminal uh, diagnosis, you know, that's that's public. Um. <clears throat> It does say personal data. That could mean your address or that could mean how much money you paid. So I don't know. Again, with all of these breaches, man, we, me and you, the individual, are the victims. Harvard Pilgrim, bad look, but like they're going to keep keep on rocking. So again, in 2024, you, you have to assume, not just as a practitioner defending a business, assume breach, but like as an individual, your data, assume breach. Right. So actually, I'm going to be, um, I'm actually piloting or trying out this platform called Delete Me. I don't know if anyone in chats used Delete Me, but I'm going to be using it. Um, it kind of helps like scrub your personal data. Cause if, if they do get your data from a data breach, yeah, they've got that, but they can use that to go find out more about you, especially if you get targeted as like a high net worth individual or someone who has access to, a business that's like high net worth or, or very interesting, right? Like, um, I don't know. Leonardo Machete, first time or live, we'll count it. Welcome to the party. OS bugs that allow unauthenticated and remote DOS attacks. These security updates are for its iOS and iOS XE operating system software for networking gear, as well as patches for its access point software. The updates for Cisco iOS mitigate a total of 14 vulnerabilities, 10 of which are denial of service, DOS, the most severe of which could allow unauthenticated remote exploitation. The other bugs patched allow privilege escalation, command injection, and access control list bypass. A link to the security update from Cisco is available in the show notes to this episode. All right, I was talking with... um. BSEC here, so I missed part of this story. But I do find it funny, just really quickly. Unauthenticated remote denial of service attack. I'm sure it has to do with not pushing network bandwidth, Adam. But like, <laughs> I hate to be such a a nerd, okay? But like, all denial of service attacks, not all, but like the 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 prototypical denial of service attack is unauthenticated. It's literally pushing traffic from many, 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 many endpoints into one endpoint. 
You don't need to authenticate before you push data. Okay. So I just find it like, I don't want to say laughable, but it, it, it kind of cracks me up that they threw unauthenticated in there because, and remote that that's like how denial of service attacks work in general. There are other forms of denial of service attacks, like wiper viruses, firmware flashing. Like there's, there's another whole subset, but like when you say denial of service without any other context, most people are going to think of, you know, amplification attacks and like ping of death and stuff like they're going to think, or not ping of death, like Smurf attacks and stuff they're, or fraggle attack. They're going to think pushing large amounts of data. So anyways, I hate to be so nerdy about it, but you know what I do. All right. So this is an unauthenticated remote uh, denial of service attack. So I suspect this means that uh, Cisco has some vulnerability that would allow access to a Cisco box that's internet facing and allow you to like configure it to brick itself or to stop data from passing. So that's what's up. Um, 10 of the bugs are denial. Okay. So listen, Cisco released 14 volumes. If you're running Cisco, if you're a Cisco shop, obviously you should listen. If you're a practitioner at an organization that has a networking team, this is a right click copy paste email to the networking team. Hey guys, Cisco, Cisco bugs dropped. Um, you know, I just want to make you aware of it. Don't even tell, here's another like pro tip. Don't tell the networking team to fix it. Just tell them, Hey, this came out. Looks like it's, uh, could be serious. Or maybe you don't say that because you don't want to, um, say the sky is falling, but Hey, this came out. Wanted to let you know, uh, curious, uh, is, is this on your radar? Like engage them, empower them. And then maybe next week or two weeks from now, bring it back up. Hey, did you guys close those bugs? Hey, whatever happened with those vulnerabilities? Did you, did you look at them? Right? Like, again, there's a soft way to do it and a hard way to do it. So yeah, some of these bugs allow privesque, which is not good. Command injection, which is not good. Um, so maybe you don't give them a week, maybe you give them three days and then you, uh, you'd be like, we got to get this, uh, done. Way to go, uh, Cisco. C oh, so I stand down, okay? Sissa, our lady Jen Easterly, our lady of cybersecurity, excuse me, Jen Easterly. Where's my Jen Easterly emote? Okay, uh, has released a notification uh, yesterday saying that they urge businesses and admins to update as soon as possible. So the guidance has changed, right click, copy paste this, then right click, copy paste this, and then email the networking team and say, hey guys, at the federal level, the Department of Homeland Security is suggesting that this get patched right away. Are we exposed? Yes or no? And if we are, how do we fix that? Uh, BSEC is saying this is for the XE platform. So not all platforms are in scope. Yeah, you definitely, you know what? Another thing really quickly. You do want to look at the Cisco advisory and make sure they'll always have, um, they'll usually have a list of like in scope technologies. Yeah, you can see here. Um, well, I don't know, BSEC. It says iOS and iOS XE software security advisory. So I don't know if it's XE only. I know you guys can't read this, but. I don't know if it's XE only. Cisco has both iOS and iOS XE in here. So this is a right-click copy-paste, both um, this advisory and the CISA warning to patch immediately and get, get on the same page with your networking team. Over 8,000 records from UK school tracking software provider exposed in data breach. According to cybersecurity researcher Jeremiah Fowler, the breach involved a non-password protected database that contained over 800,000 documents belonging to a UK-based school tracking software provider. The records included an estimated 214,000 unique images of school-aged children, along with files that displayed students' first and last names and details about their schooling. The tracking software called OTRAC is developed by Juniper Education and is used for school financial management, teacher training, education HR support, and school visits planning. Fowler, an ethical researcher, implies no wrongdoing by OTRAC, 
Juniper Education or the educational institutions, but simply brings events like this to public attention. It is not known, however, how long the data was exposed or if anyone else gained access to the records. We All right. Uh, so before we like lose our mind about tracking kids, there are instances where, you know, it does make sense. It just can be weaponized. Um, I, I just want to point out, like, this is why the state of Maryland, for example, is trying to pass regulation around data minimization act. Like, is all this data on these kids needed to track them for school visits and stuff? Right. I mean, this looks like a lot of data, a lot of information. Maybe, maybe it is required for all of them. But guys, this is the reality. When data is created, you know, there is a risk that it gets exposed. And then what happens with that data? Uh, obviously, you know, children is a very sensitive topic. Um, hopefully, none of these, none of this data is weaponized in a way that ends up hurting children. That would be horrible. Um, and I want to know. Um, so it just says that the database was publicly exposed. <gasps> that I know you guys can't see it on 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 stream. Uh, it says that the the database was publicly exposed, which basically means it was a misconfigured asset on the internet. A tool like Fortrace, um, which I think was just acquired by Flare, um, could have found this. Okay, it does not mean the data was pulled down. It doesn't mean that threat actors have weaponized it. It doesn't mean kids have been hurt. Okay. It also doesn't mean that has not happened. You, as a practitioner, should always, or at least work it into your workflows, be looking at your external facing assets and proactively monitoring, right? Just because you, here's the thing, you can't do it once a year. You scan today, hey, everything looks good. Tomorrow, Carl stands up a database and misconfigures it. Or next week, Kim toggles uh, a configuration by accident while she's troubleshooting and exposes the database. And then it's exposed for a year, right? So you need proactive measures. That's why we have automation tools. That's why we have things like Shodan and Fortrace and, and other tools to proactively help us and do the heavy lifting and just notify us when bad happens, right? So let's just say, Going back to my example, Kim, whoever Kim is, not Kimberly can fix it. Another Kim misconfigures this database and it's exposed. And within 24 hours, you get notified and you fix the exposure. It was still exposed, right? So now was it compromised? You need logs on accessing that database. So make sure you're doing logging as well. So here's the thing. If you can definitively prove through logs that the database, while it was exposed, was not accessed, then you don't have a breach, right? But if you don't have the logs, then you can't have confidence to make that statement, and therefore you have to assume breach. Same thing happens in HIPAA, right? I saw I've seen multiple times where um multiple times where a person who works in healthcare is like emailing personal information or personal health information all over the place, and their email gets popped. Threat actor goes in the email and all the threat actor wanted to do was set up forwarding so they could spam out Viagra ads to a bunch of people from a trusted email address. Threat actor did not go through the victim's email account, right? So when that happens, that you would technically have a HIPAA breach because let's say that the doctor a week before sent an Excel file with like a thousand um, patient records in it. Well, even though the threat actor logged into that account and never looked at that email, if you don't have audit logs to prove that, then you have to assume breach. You cannot definitively say with certainty that there was no breach. Now, if you have tools, and Microsoft used to have a tool, I think it was called Unicorn or Magic Unicorn or Pixie Unicorn or something like that, then you could do that, right? So I'm just saying not because when there's a breach, it doesn't necessarily mean the threat actor gave a damn about that data, there could have been alternative motives, but unless you're able to uh, prove it, it's a hot mess express. We've got a Friday packed with live streams today. It starts. All right. What's up, everybody? I hope you got value from the show. We're wrapping. What time is it? 8.55. Tell Nick Barker he gets five minutes back. This has been... 
Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief Podcast, episode 589. We had some jokes, we had some laughs, we had some tears, but all in all, we had some first timers. All in all, we had a great show. If you can hang around, stay tuned for Jaw Jack, and it's a 30 minute segment where we straight kick it, AMA. I don't know if <clears throat> Yosef is in chat from Pennsylvania, but he was hot. Hot on the questions last night during my uh, Katie Paxton Fear live stream. So if he's in chat, we can answer your questions. But if you just got to get out of here, hey, I hope you have a great weekend. I hope uh, the weather treats you well. And uh, be sure to tell someone you love that you love them. You never know, right? I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. Until next time, stay secure. Let's go get some jaw jacking. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Jaw Jacking, the 30-minute segment where we answer your questions about cybersecurity, share resources, and generally high-five each other digitally. I'm Jerry Guy, your host for the next 30 minutes, coming hot off the heels from Daily Cyber Threat Brief. Dr. Gerald Lozier, that nerd. Seriously, though, I hope everyone had a great stream, great show. It's good to see all of you in chat. Anna Lynn, good to see you. I hadn't seen your name in a minute. I hope everything's well. I always love Jeremy Williams. I always love seeing people who were, you know, really active in the community at one point. Um, and then, you know, life happens, things come up, uh, and then getting to see you again in, in live stream. It's always nice. Thanks, Cyber Kiwi. We try to have fun with it. Never try to take yourself too seriously. Always trying to I mean, this is my job. I don't want to be like, ugh. Like, I never want to come out here into the Buffer Osier Flow studio and be like, oh my God, I got to do a stream. Like, oh, right? So have fun. Thanks, Triple D. I appreciate that. Billy Orella with an update. I heard back from the interview on boarding process. Shall take two to three weeks with the city. Thanks for the cyber threat news. Way to go, Billy. Straight crushing it. Did we get someone to pick up the baton? Speaking of Billy, Logan Fuller, Gerald Ozier, what's the number one piece of advice you would give me for my interview for an IT auditor role today? Oh boy. Well, first of all, congratulations on the interview. Two, I'll give you two pieces of advice, Logan. One, when, uh, and like, I, I guess I would just say this somehow in the interview. One of the, if you've taken my GRC course, you know this, but like one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're doing IT audit is like literally just reading the question, like not preparing for the audit. If the question is like, um, you know, like, how are you doing access? Like if it boils down to like, tell me how you're doing your access um, workflows, like onboarding, changing roles, uh, terminations, right? But when you're looking at an IT audit rec, a reg that's been written, it's very like, it's very like two things. One, it's like wicked specific. And then two, there's a lot of other like nonsense stuff in there. And if you read it verbatim, you are going to look like an absolute donkey because the person you're interviewing for the audit is going to be like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't understand your question because that wasn't like normal English. That was whatever that was. And if you, A, can't distill it into normal English, that's a problem. And then two, if you didn't prepare and you're just reading it and you don't know what it says, you have lost everything in that interview, uh, the audit itself. So what I, what I would recommend is like kind of fold it in. Like one of the important things of a successful audit is to make the interviewed person feel like you're not um, judging them on whether or not they're doing their job. And then two, to be able to clearly communicate what you are actually asking them about. That's what I would say, um, Logan. And then obviously, um, you know, maybe maybe do a quick run through of uh, it's it is audit. You are going to run into some some situations where audit like is something in place. Like, do you have multi? Here's a perfect example. Do you have multi-factor authentication in place? Well. Yes and no, right? We have it for all of our Office 365 accounts, but we don't have it on our Cisco 
networking gear. Like, so it's not a yes or no Boolean answer, but an auditor typically wants like a very definitive answer. So you have to be practical um, with what you're asking, right? And, and final thing, since whatever, one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my entire career, ever, I just want to share this, is it's, it's like unbelievably dumb. Uh, like, you are so dumb. Okay. In NIST 853, all the control families, I know this is a super specific example, but all the control families start with dash one. And the dash one control for every control family is do you have policy? Do you have procedure relative to this control family? And everything after that is like, you know, do you have backups? And are you following the process for doing backups? And are the backups being backed up in alignment with policy or whatever? One of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life is an auditor say, okay, we're doing access control now. Do you have an access control policy? And do you have procedures to implement that policy? And the person said, no, we don't have policy. Like they're, they're just an immature organization. And the auditor was like, well, I guess we're done here since you fail all the other controls because you don't have policy and procedure. None of the other controls matter. And basically x the entire audit. Wicked waste of everyone's time and a complete bonehead uh, observation by the auditor. So, you know, obviously don't make that mistake. I don't think you would, but all right. Curious Circuits with the super chat. Thanks, Curious Circuits. We just become best friends. Yep. I would like to communicate more with the community, but at the time the show is going on, I'm at work and I'm not allowed to use my phone. Thanks for the super chat, Curious Circuit. I hear you. Um, Curious Circuit, get on Discord. Engage in Discord, right? Discord's like always going on and always uh, super, super fun, super cool. I want to give a shout out. I said hi to James McQuiggan earlier. I think he gave 10 gifted subs. Can we just be <clears> best friends? Yep. If I didn't recognize the gifted subs, James, I'm sorry. James McQuiggan at 35,000 feet. Uh, and if there's 10 new squad members, welcome to the party and giddy up on that. Um, giddy up on the um, squad emo tray. Get our Oprah's on. Hold on. Let me check my calendar. I should have checked my calendar. Make sure I don't have a meeting. Jerry Brandon Sink. Oh my God. Hold on one second. Um, <clears throat> can hold on one second. Brandon. I got it. I'm sorry. I'm I'm supposed to be in a meeting. <laughs> hold on one second. Can we push to 930? All right. Uh, well, we're gonna see. I might have to end this quick. Or I don't know. I know BSEC had the uh sun's out, guns out earlier when I saw him. So he may not be uh on camera ready, but I might have to bail. Um, guys, really quick, we need someone to take on the baton. The, who wants to take the Simply Cyber Community Challenge baton on? I'm telling you, ask Billy. Ask Billy uh, in chat. Ask anyone who's done it. It's really good. Uh, Logan Fuller says, thanks so much. Solid advice. Going to review the auditor and risk management sections of the GRC analyst course before I hand it. Yeah, uh, that would be a really great move too, for sure. No doubt. And one of the, one of the things that people should know is like audit like risk assessment is like audit plus plus, right? Cause like when you do an audit or when you do a risk assessment, you're kind of looking at all the same things. If you're doing a comprehensive enterprise one, the risk assessment is taking it one step further and looking at like the gaps that the audit discovered, like how bad are those gaps? That's what the risk assessments out. Space tacos. Space tacos wants the baton. All right. Yeah, Space Tacos, haven't you had it? Glum Hippo has a question. Am I allowed to feel the prompt engineer as a job title is dystopian AF? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I feel like prompt engineer is such like a trend right now. It's like, I don't know, like guru. Is that a trend? Like... You can put it in there, but to me, it's like, I don't know, like prompt engineering. That's like a skill, not a role. You know what I mean? Claudia Manta with the super chat. Thanks, Claudia. Wow. Just best friends. Yep. Appreciate it. Really nice to see you. Uh, Don L will take the baton. Don, Don, I don't think Don L has taken the baton before. Don, can you confirm if you've had the baton before or not? 
Yeah, hey, and really quick, Cyber Kiwi, you can... <clears throat> Dawn, like, hold on, is Dawn L... I think Dawn L hasn't had the baton. And if you can't be here for live, um, that's okay. You're here now for the live. You could take the baton and then... Does prompt engineering pay well? Are there actual prompt engineer jobs right now? Can you imagine someone putting like senior prompt engineer, 18 years of experience? <laughs> All right. So keeping it going. I, I don't like dead air. like to keep it going up in here. I uh, do want to get someone uh, to take the baton. I know Don L had asked. So... <clears throat> Yeah, well, when AI starts generating itself, we're screwed. That's a problem. All right. Cyber Kiwi. Let's go. Don L. I don't know what happened to Don L. I feel like we I feel like we've got it here. Cyber Kiwi, get on deck. If I don't hear from Don L in like the next 30 seconds. Uh, Cyber Kiwi, if you would be um, available, we'd love to take it. Yeah, Phil Stafford with the uh, Phil Stafford with the, um, the the Captain Phillips thing. View Tran said, "Okay, so View called it called it out. Uh, I don't see View Tran on the. Um, unfortunately, I don't see View Tran in chat right now. Looks like maybe View Tran dipped out. So." All right. Thank you, BSEC. Um, Jenny Housley, I'll defer to you. Be good, Alana Boyajian. All right, so Don L's here. Don L, take the baton. I'm sorry, Jenny, I just said that. All right, so Don L, please accept the baton pass. Okay, future. Should we do two batons today? It is Easter weekend. So Viewtran had it first, right? All right, so let's do this. Viewtran asked for the baton first during the daily cyber threat brief. We will go with Viewtran. View, you have the baton. Please share your story. And Don L, please come back on Monday. Um, and we'll, we'll try to hand the baton off to you. All right, Rex Cognito says, uh, can you elaborate on the capabilities of Delete Me? Yep. Oh, let me look at my... Okay, I pushed my meeting to 9.30 and also got a request to permanently change this meeting so this doesn't happen every time. Uh, delete me. Uh, a lot of people have been using it. Um, I'll be, I'll be uh, telling you way more about them the last two weeks of April uh, as they're going to become a sponsor. But uh, delete me, basically, you can put your information into delete me and it'll go scour the internet and help find where all your data is and then help you with the request for removal. It's pretty, pretty powerful, pretty cool. Um, okay. Jenny or Kimberly, can you help Don L on what the ask is for the, the, the baton, holding the baton? Howard passed his first interview for junior SOC analyst. Bunch of technical questions. I knew them all thanks to Simply Cyber. Heck yeah, Howard. Straight crushing it, homie. Love it, love it, love it. Love it. All right. So go view Tran. That's perfect. Uh, my Easter plans. Um, nothing really, nothing really crazy going on y'all. Um, it's, it's a uh, spring break here for the, for the kiddos. So Mrs. Ozier and the kids are actually traveling to go visit, uh, grandparents while I hold down the fort with the puppies and all that. Want to remind everybody, if you do live or have access to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, the low country chapter of the Simply Cyber Community local meetup is going to be having a meetup on April 3rd from 6 to 8 p.m. at Frothy Beard Brewing. Um, so come on out if, you, if you're in the low country area. I know casually Joseph, Eric Taylor might make an appearance. Uh, Rhonda, if she's around, maybe getting in there, whoever. I know some people who are t uh, adjacent to the Simply Cyber community are coming. Uh, 
All right. So Gary Sturgiatis is asking, do you know what Katie's concerns regarding the state of current CVEs was? Uh, no, Gary, I'm sorry. I actually don't recall exactly what Katie had said about the CVEs. I do remember talking about the CVEs, but I don't remember uh, definitively what uh, her take was. So, so sorry, that's pretty, pretty weak. <laughs> that's a pretty weak response. I actually... I, I actually hate having crappy answers to questions, Gary. So I'm sorry. I apologize. Rhonda's going to be there. All right, Rhonda. Actually, one of the owners of the brewery himself works in the space. So he'll be there too. Oh, hey, want everybody to know this is wicked important. If you're still here, 254 of you, you guys are in luck. Monday's episode is April 1st, which is new um, April Fool's Day. And uh, we do a we do it. It's the only day of the year I do it. We will be doing some fun stuff on stream, including replacing chat YouTube chat with Discord chat. Okay, so if you want to be on stream like this on Monday, you'll have to be on Discord. And it's a it's a it's a riot. It's a laugh riot. It's hilarious. The gifs coming through. I I I I can't, I can't I like lose it. Uh, it's going to be good. I can't access mod chat the same time as the uh, where the gifs are and stuff. So I, I, mods can't help me. I'm a hot mess. Uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. All right, let's go. I wish there was a meetup near me, Steph Clewis. Well, hey, if you didn't know, uh, everyone definitely take advantage of the Simply Cyber local meetups channel. I'm going to bring it on stream. Who knows what screen you're going to get here? Oh, you got the right one. Um, the locals meetup channel. Kimberly can fix it. Our very own mod. By the way, can we throw out some mod love? Uh, mod love. The mod's always doing great work here. Kimberly can fix it has actually alphabetized the local meetups. So if there is uh, somebody who's stepped forward and been an ambassador and wants to run it for their community, uh, this is where it is. We got uh, BSEC running Houston, uh, Kimberly at Flow Rida, Josh Mason doing the DC metro area, Marcus Kyler of the Yeet Crew <laughs> up in Detroit, Jesse Johnson, Chi Town, Beaton Town, Austin, Hotlanta. They're all here. Come check them out. It's kind of gotten a little bit crazy. One channel that just emerged today or yesterday, John Hoyt, uh, ambassador for the upstate of South Carolina. So South Carolina repping two different channels uh, up in here. So if you're in the Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia area, and you want to high five like a boss, uh, definitely check out that channel. It's all about good times and community. Going back to this one. Taylor M looking to get some hot Lana up in the North space, Alpharetta area. Giddy up on that. All right, let me go back to mod chat. Keep looking, keep, keep hustling. I'm up here hustling. Love it. What's going on y'all questions. We got any questions? Oh, DJ B sec did the alphabetizing. I'm sorry. I thought, um, I thought Kimberly could fix it because doing the alphabetizing. Oh my God. Kimberly can fix it on the couch right now. Eating grapes is just like, huh? I guess I, I, I'll take, I'll take a, a W for that. DJ B sec has done the alphabetization. I am sorry uh, for getting that wrong. I read mod chat incorrect. I'm a donkey, a flaming donkey. See you later, Keith Sloan. Jason Summers with a question. Having a few years of programming and web dev freelance experience on top of my cyber knowledge, would it be possible to jump right into a security engineering role over an analyst? All right. So what I'll point out, Jason, really quick is there's a, there's a nuance to your question that I want to qualify. So in the world of information security, right, there's two kind of like categories of roles. There's analyst and there's engineer. And typically the analyst is like, reporting and, and, you know, um, booking and stuff like that. And like the engineer is like hand, like, you know, configuring things, toggling things, uh, responding to things. Right. 
So you can be a SOC analyst and you're like in intake. It can be a technical role. Analysts can be technical. So you could be taking in alerts and responding to them and executing processes and playbooks. The engineer is the one who's like putting security onion in place and configuring uh, detection rules and stuff like that. So both of those roles can be entry level. So your question about jumping past analysts to be an engineer is not 100% accurate because both of them can be entry level roles if you're picking up what I'm putting down. For those reasons and your background and experience, in the fact that there are entry level engineer roles, you can absolutely get into that space and it will be more technical. Okay. So giddy up on that. When's the next AMA? The next AMA will be next Friday. So we've got it. We've got a banger of a week for you guys next week. Uh, we really do have to get better. I, I have to get better. Um, simply cyber.io. Oh my God. Hold on one second. On simplycyber.io, I do have to be more vigilant about this. But if you go to simplycyber.io and you scroll to the bottom, there's actually a calendar of events. And I want to get better at this. Like right now, like I'm not doing this cyber range platform streaming anymore. Um, the daily cyber threat briefs on Tuesday isn't there. So like this needs to be fixed a little bit. But you should be able to go here and see when the AMAs are and see when stuff is happening. So I'll just tell you, next week on Monday, it's April Fool's Day, we're going to be doing the fun stream on um, fr- uh, Thursday. Jason Haddix uh, is going to be my guest, and he's crushing it. And on Friday, we've got a lot of activities. On Friday, we got the Daily Cyber Threat Brief. I am doing the quarterly all-hands town hall meeting for the Simply Cyber community. And if you don't know what that is, once a quarter, I report to the community on what has been done, what I'm going to be doing and how, um, you know, I engage with the community. And if you have any feedback or, uh, criticism or whatever, that's the opportunity to air the grievances. And then we're going to be doing the AMA at 1 PM on discord. Also want to let everybody know we made a decision as a mod team that we will not be recording the discord AMA and putting it on public stream. The reason is we want people to feel confident that um, if they share something personal or share something about their business, that that isn't getting broadcast to the wider internet. It is only for the Discord community in order to um, provide a little bit more of a, you know, uh, what do they call that? Uh, Chatham house rules kind of thing. Okay. So hopefully that answers all your questions. In fact, if you go on Discord... Uh, if you go on Discord, hold on. If you go on Discord and look right here at the top of Discord, it'll say one event. And like I've scheduled it. So now you can see the AMAs April 5th, May 3rd, June 7th. All right. So there's always, I guess you always have to st- come back and stay in tune with Simply Cyber simply because. I'm terrible about telling you all the things like we're doing so much over here that like, I just forget or get overwhelmed. All right. Um, does merely, what time is it? Does merely using databases and systems count as years for CISSP qualifying year? Need two more years of experience, but curious if this has been successful for anyone else. Uh, let's do this really quickly. Um, you can be very liberal with this. Um, let me see really quickly. CISP years of experience. Let's let's do an audit, right? This is how to do it. Boom. Work experience in the domains. Databases. Let's see. Architecture and engineering. Software development. All right. Here's what I would say. If you've been doing databases and systems, right? System administration. If you were doing anything with user access to those databases doing any type of um, tokenization in the database in order to secure the data from an unauthorized access with your systems. If you were doing backups, yes, all of that qualifies for years of experience. Giddy up, get on it. Follow-up question from Juan Rodriguez. What is the difference between network analyst and technical analyst? I mean, technical analyst is a pretty generic term. Network analyst, at least you could think that it has to do with like, 
I get, I mean, I think network engineer more than network analyst. Uh, to me, those are both kind of generic interchangeable terms that might really depend on like what industry it is. Technical analyst might be more consulting. So it's more useful network analyst might be on in-house on a networking team. And it's like a junior person who's not allowed to make configuration changes, but does audit and stuff like that on the network. Uh, BSEC, if you have a thought, one Rodriguez in chat's asking the difference between network analyst and technical analyst. If you've seen that, uh, BSEC's a network engineer. ZMF says, tell me the crap show that is bingo will be happening again. Oh, thank you, ZMF. Bingo will be happening next Friday as well. Jesus. that's See what I mean? I forget things. Next Friday, the first Friday of the month, we will do bingo and AMAs. So bingo and Discord AMA will always be together. Okay. Thank you, ZMF, for reminding me. All right. How are we doing? Let's go. All right. Josh Mason saying network analysis or network analysts are focused on network traffic for IR and threat hunting. Love it. Logan Fuller, hope you have a great weekend. Everyone enjoy. I have to go. Be good, Logan Fuller. Cyber Kiwi, IAM roles. Generally, if the company is using a third-party IDP that wants to add custom scripts. Okay. Jessica Probst, a.k.a. Cyber Kill Jane, a.k.a. High Five, Jessica. Anyone have experience building, building internship training? I'm struggling to consolidate info so they get as much value as possible from the short rotation with our team. Yeah, um, Jessica, I've actually built an internship program at MUSC that ran for a few years and was pretty successful. Um, I might be able to get that. I still know people that work there. Hashtag insider threat. I might be able to get the documentation and stuff. But basically, um, at a high level, you know, set goals for them, set expectations for them, talk to the different business units or, you know, not business units, but the different capabilities on the team on how they would want to engage infosec interns right um if you can try to document um like one of the big challenges with internships is that you're taking someone away from a job in order to talk to the intern and educate them so if you can asynchronously educate them with documentation and potentially video like a loom video or something on like hey you're going to be doing um you're going to be doing you're going to be responding to third party security assessments. Here is our SSP or here is our SharePoint with our policies and procedures. Go through these policies and procedures. These policies and procedures explain X, Y, and Z. Here, do that for a few days, get familiar with it. And then next time I respond to a third party questionnaire, I'm going to do it with you. Or you actually video record you going through a questionnaire and have them review that. And then they can do the next one and then bring questions, right? Like try cyber kill Jane I, or Jessica, try to like separate the need to educate them from taking people off the keyboard uh, as much as you can. You still need them to be engaged, obviously bring them to the meetings um, and then set up time for them to ask questions, time for them to explore, time for them to learn. That's what I would say. Nerman with the super chat, Dr. Ozier, the summer I'm planning to go back to school to do my master's in cyber. Very nice. I love that, Nerman. Also super chat, Nerman. Uh, do you have any suggestions? For instance, which area should I focus on? All right. So Nerman, um, you know, I mean, for me personally, if you're going to focus on an area, you should focus on something that's specifically interesting to you. So a lot of master's programs, you'll have to take like, say, seven classes, usually they're 10 classes, right? Uh, you'll have to take seven classes that everybody takes in the masters and then three classes that are focused on your area of interest. So I can't really tell you where to focus because like maybe you're into databases or maybe you're into web applications or maybe you're into cryptography, right? Um, if you're doing it for promotion and job and stuff, I'd either recommend looking at cloud, looking at management, or looking at um, what else is kind of like hot right now? GRC, get some of that. Always hot. Uh, one of the best things, you know, you don't need higher education to work in the industry. But in my experience, my favorite part, um, and I, I have a master's in computer science and I have a master's in information assurance, just to like like give perspective on what what, what my experience has been in my perspective. The thing I loved about my master's degrees is that like you get kind of an exposure and challenge across 
multiple dimensions that you normally wouldn't get access to, right? So I came up the GRC track. I've done a lot of um, like blue team stuff because, you know, all hands on deck, you work at a smaller organization. You can't be like, I'm GRC. I'm not going to respond to this compromise, right? But when I did a master's degree, I did a whole course on privacy. I did a whole course on um, digital forensics, right? And getting my hands dirty with FTK and doing chain of custody. Like nowhere in my professional career have I ever had the opportunity to go deep down in the in the weeds with digital forensics. So, and it was fun, right? Malware analysis. I don't get to do malware analysis. Like in my day-to-day job, I take malware and I throw it in um, any run and I see how bad it is. And then I respond and clean up and move on, right? Like I don't get to like dissect malware as cool as that is. It's just, there's too much going on. So for me, a master's degree gives you way more exposure at a deeper level across industry. So then you can bring those experiences and knowledges to other places. So yes, you can work in the field without a degree. Uh, but like, say you come in as a SOC analyst, you know, maybe everything you see is like from that SOC analyst uh, purview. All right. I know that was more than what the question asked, but it is what it is. 926. I got a couple minutes. 927. Uh, can you briefly explain how bingo works? Oscar Navas. Yeah. So we're going to have to beta test this. I probably need uh, someone. I, 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 Not probably. I need someone. I know Chris Whitlock and Chris Young already have done quite a bit with getting the bingo set up. I'm going to need someone to help me execute on the bingo. I, I tried to do it last week or a couple weeks ago. I cannot produce the show and be on air talent and manage the bingo. It's just not going to work. We will give you a link, Oscar, and everybody in chat. You will receive a link and you'll be able to generate a unique bingo card for yourself for that day. As I go through the show, I might say things like, I don't know, um, you know, maybe I might say like, oh, this is a speculative hot take or ransomware or, you know, whatever, Deb Wigley's name. Or I might play a sound effect like that or like that. And when those things happen, you tap, you, you mark it on the bingo card. And if you get, you know, five across, five down, five diagonal, you get, all right. So DJ b volunteered for bingo. Thank you, b Um, If you get a bingo, you win. We haven't figured out prizes and stuff. We're still trying to figure it all out, but it is good times. It's fun. And uh, that's what's up. So, uh, shit, shoot. Maybe I'll even make a little video and play it. Like I'll make like a 30 second video and on first Fridays, right before bingo, I will play the video to explain exactly how it works with screen caps and everything. Okay. I think that's maybe warranted multiple people asking. All right. It's nine 29. I got to get going. Um, shout out to Brandon pool at Panopsi for allowing me to be late 30 minutes to our meeting. <laughs> if he's in chat right now, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. Have a wonderful Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Happy Easter if you celebrate. And come back for April 1st because it's going to be an off-the-chain episode. Believe me. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. Your chat. Until, Until next time, stay secure. Thank you. And thanks, mods. I genuinely appreciate the mods. Thank you. If you enjoyed that content, keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one.